All right, so we have to talk about Res Publica because we put it in the title of the episode. Res Publica is a Kinesia game that I had never played until PAX. I and never played it until this weekend. Yeah, Chris busts out and I played, played it once, it. and that's all I need to play. I like it because no ga- the, cl- the only game I can think of that has a mechanic even close to this in terms of the mechanic that's interesting in this game is Hanabi. Yeah, but Hanabi's better by a lot. This is a game where there's two resources... And you're trying to build the most stuff by making sets right, of Right, there's dudes. two decks of cards. You have to make sets and succeed in the first deck of cards, and you can start getting cards from the second deck, and the second deck is actually worth victory points. So yes. it's pretty much build a machine, and then score, and then the game's over. But the mechanic, and this is all I want to focus on, the game itself, like it's... it's Play it if you're a game designer and you want to see how this works. This mechanic It's really is straightforward and simple and not really the greatest, but Well, it could be. It, just, it's basic it it's really nuance. just it's really just here's this game mechanic. Let's implement it in the simplest possible, most straightforward way and the end. But the mechanic is such. So think about games like Bonanza, about games like I think Bonanza does it better. No, does I think Bonanza better. does it worse, but Bonanza is a more fun game. Maybe. Because there's no information economy in Bonanza, really. Not like the strict That's true. In Bonanza, you could just be like, yeah, I got 10 Kogumi. In fact, oh my, imagine mm-hmm. Bonanza if you use some of the ideas from this game. Maybe. got to think on Anyway, so here's the mechanic. On your turn, you'll have a hand of cards, and you either say, I have something, or I want something. And you can. So in saying that, you're giving information away. Obviously, if you say you have something, you have to have it. You can't say you have something you don't have. You can and all if you, you say can... you want something, well, that's the only thing that you could get. So clearly you must have something that goes with the thing you want in your hand, otherwise you wouldn't be saying that. So I offer a contract. I have two Langabarden. That means I will give you two Langabarden for whatever you offer. Right. So we so go we, clockwise. You so go around got... the table. So since Rim started with an I have, everyone else has to reply with an I have, right? So Rim said he has two Langabarden. I have two shift bow. And everyone else says, I have one shift bow. I have three cards. Yep. And who cares what they are? Yep. And you go around, and then I can choose not to trade, or I can pick one of those deals and do it. So if he picks me, he has to give me two Langobard, and I have to give him two shift bow, because that's what we said that we had. Oh, yeah, the game, the we copy of the we game we have ne- is just in German. We so. can't negotiate, right? We have to do what we said was the thing. Yeah, it's, it's a very structured market. So if I say, I want... Then Scott would say, I want. Yeah, you have to reply to a want with a want and a have with a have. So if he says he wants a shift bow, I have to, A, have to have a shift bow. I can't say I want something if I don't have the shift bow that he wants. So to step it up a little further, you can have up to two clauses and an and or an or between them. So I could say, I want two shift bow or two Langobarden. So that means I can reply with a want, as long as I have either two Shifba or two Langobardens. And then I would say, I want something. So now, if we actually, Rim chooses me for the deal, it's up to me whether to give him the shift bows or the Langobard. Yeah, so if because I, I say, said or, I decide which of those ors I'm going to give. Yeah, so if I say I have X or Y, fuck you. I'm, I don't, you, I don't, you don't get to pick which one. So I have or is kind of a dick deal. But you can use that to share yeah, information. Something I thought about immediately after playing that I never did during the game yep. was could I lie using an or? For example, I have one shift bow in my hand. Yep. Could I say, I have one shift bow or one something I don't have? I can see from your hand. And then always hand, give the shift bow. Uh, no, you cannot. I'm reasonably sure. Mm. No one did that because I don't think you can. We can because when I give him, if you give someone something after an or, you give it to them face down so that only you and they know what you actually gave and no one else does. So think about this. I might say something, you know, what, what, when I'm saying my haves and wants, I might have a part of the clause that is something I actually want to do, but I'm also trying to share information. Like I'm trying to impart, like say it's my turn and I offer something to Scott, I might also be saying something because I want Chris to offer me something on his turn. And I'm trying to share information without right, you're too negotiating much information. without directly negotiating by saying that you want some like someone just says you know they have one something and it's like it goes around and no one has anything and then you're like I want two of that something you just said you had one of yep 
Yeah. But you got to be careful because if you share too much information, like if Scott keeps talking about how he has Langobar and is trying to get rid of him, and then suddenly Can he says, Can you look I, up some more of the cards beside Langobarns and Shift Bows? Uh, Vikinger? Anglo Saxons. Anglo Saxons and Vikingers? Vikingers. Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Shift Bow. Shift Bow. But. If Scott keeps saying, I have Langobard and I have Langobard, and then suddenly he's like, I want Langobard, well, yeah, I'm not going to give, no one's going to give him fucking Langobard now because he's going to make his set. Yeah. He suddenly got, like, by luck, close enough to be there to his set. So the game is a pretty rough game if you really play to win because you got to keep track of what people have and want based on these negotiated contracts and this information economy. It was too much for me to ever bother trying to do fully yeah i'm like at the beginning of the game i started to get a picture in my head of what were in people's hands and before it got around the table once i gave the fuck up so <laughs> information economy games but i would say if you're just a casual i ended gamer, up just like sort of associating one card with each player at any given turn yep well it's like in tne all i think about is for everyone else what do they have the least of and i try to keep track of that and i ignore everything else they have the least of the thing no one has any of yeah uh, <laughs> so do not get this game just as a general gamer. I'd honestly only recommend it if, one, you're a Rainier Kinesia fan, like you really just want to go through his uh, his works. Or this... if you're a game designer and you want to study this mechanic. Yes, if you're a game designer who is interested in information economies, because there aren't that many games that do it well, and I suspect information... Or if you're some sort of game researcher or something, yep. right? This information economy games are rare, and they might be a way to solve some of the problems of shitty co-op games like Pandemic. Right, but yeah, there's a lot you can learn from this game, but there's not a lot of fun that normal people could have playing this game, or anyone could have playing this game. It's like, I played it once, and I don't need to play it again, really. Yeah, I, so, I understand it now. So the third type of person to play it is if you're one of those people who's played every game, like, this is novel... And you'll get pure novelty from it because you haven't played a game like it before. Yeah, a few times. Yeah. I mean, some people have played, like, most of the games in the PAX library, and you're sitting there like, ah, what do I play that isn't Tiggers and Euphrates? Yep. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.